I gotta practice for the AP C mechanics test, so why not show you guys me practicing? It'll be epic. After all, it's the first AP, so why not? Why not? Next time I'll try to do the ENM one too, but I don't know whether that'll be out on time. It should be, it should be, okay, don't worry. Hello everybody, I'm Ferrara, and today we're gonna be taking the 2019 APC Mechanics FRQ Set 1. Let's see how it goes, 45 minutes on the clock, and let's get started. All right, so in an experiment, a student used video analysis to track the motion of an object falling vertically through a liquid in a glass cylinder. The object of mass m is equal to 12g is released from rest at the top of the column of fluid. The data for the speed v of the falling object as a function of time t are graphed on the grid below. The dash curve represents the best fit chosen by the students for these data. Wait, does it? Oh, start from rest at the top? Oh, okay. Well, the speed is increasing because, <laughs> I mean, it's just going up, right? And it's all positive velocity, so yes, speed is increasing. Interesting question, too. In a brief statement, describe the direction of the object's acceleration and how the magnitude of this acceleration changed as the object fell. Bro, what? <laughs> uh, I mean, well, okay, so clearly the acceleration is downward, but what? I'm assuming that, like, they made the downward direction positive and then the magnitude of the acceleration. So, magnitude of acceleration is just the slope of the line, so right here it's like. So basically the slope of the acceleration is decreasing over time. So that means that acceleration decreases. And then, or sorry, magnitude. Oh, okay. And then three is using the graph, calculate the approximate value of the magnitude of the acceleration at t is equal to 0 0.2. So right here, uh, what's the best way to do this? Oh, do we just use these two points? Wait up. That's the best way to do this. So yeah, I guess we could just use those two points. So right here, it's like 0 0.21 and 0 0.675. Yeah, 0 0.675. And we got 0 0.19 and uh, 6.5, 0 0.65. Okay, so if we find the slope between the two lines. It should just be like 0.25 over 0 0.02, which should, oops, that's not how you write a point. Oh wait, 0 0.25. Oh, no wait, what? 0 0.025, okay. And then this is gonna be 25 over 20, which is five over four, which is 1.25 meters per second squared. Epic, okay. Now we go to four. Is there a fourth part? No, there is not. Use the above equation to derive an expression for the magnitude of the vertical displacement of the falling object. Okay, so if you're given velocity, right, you basically had to integrate the velocity in order to get the vertical displacement. Oh, magnitude, yeah, okay, so that's fine. So we integrate uh, a times one minus e negative bt dt, integrate that, and then this is gonna be at, and then the other thing is that's going to be plus one over b, or negative, wait, what? Oh, I'm, I'm being control, okay, like this. Okay, so this is gonna be our y of t right here, and then let us erase all this stuff. So two is going to be the, Expression for the magnitude of the net force. So basically, that's just going to be the acceleration times the mass. So we're going to do acceleration as the derivative. So our acceleration is going to be b e to the negative b t. And then I'm going to multiply this by m. Are we given m at all? Oh, m is 12. So then we just multiply by 12 right here. Oh, it should be kilograms though. We can do 0 0.012. Okay. All right, epic. And then C, we got, the students repeat the experiment with a taller glass cylinder that is filled with the same liquid. The cylinder is tall enough so that the object reaches a constant speed. Determine the constant speed of the object. Uh, well, are we assuming the same equation? Yeah, I guess we're assuming the same equation. So, for this one, we basically got that, oh, well, this negative bt, as time goes to infinity, approximately approaches zero, right? e to the negative bt approaches zero as time goes to infinity. So that goes to zero, the, it becomes a times one minus zero, and then that's, that's equal to a. So for it should be 1.18 meters per second. To justify our answer, do we literally just say that at t is equal to infinity, v goes to 1.18? Well, that's what I'm gonna say. We'll check our answers right after this. Determine the force exerted by the fluid on the object at this time. So the force exerted by the fluid on the object should equal to the gravitational force of the object. So that's just gonna be equal to mg, so 0 0.012 times g, and that should be equal to, are we supposed to use g? I'm assuming not. 
We use 9.8, right? Okay, so 0 0.012 times 9.8. 0 0.118 Newton is epic. Okay, let us check our answers real quick. Pause the timer. Epic, we spent less than 10 minutes on the first question. That is right, let's go. Okay, first we gotta check our answers. All right, so for number one, we could say increase, okay. Uh, acceleration is downwards, but the magnitude is decreasing. Okay, good. Wait, what? What did they use? What line did they use? As long as I'm approximately there, right? It should be fine. I mean, I got 1.25, which is slightly off. Why does their graph on the solution look different from the graph on the other one? What the heck? Well, whatever. I think that'd be fine, honestly. Okay, we integrate. We get a t plus 1 over b e. Yeah, okay, that's what we did. Wait, what? what's the minus 1 here for? Oh, no! No, we forgot the constants. Rip, constants exist. So if time is equal to 0, it should have a displacement of 0. So... Right here, at t equals zero, this is gonna be one, so we gotta subtract a over b. Minus a over b, nice, okay. And then this should just be, bro, I'm trolling, what the heck? No, dude, I probably lost like, how many points did I lose? Oh, I lost two points because I lost the, the... <laughs> bro. <Bruh. laughs> I dropped the a for no reason. Okay, so that's what it would be, okay. And then C should be 0 0.118. And basically saying after a long time, okay, yeah, that's what we said basically. Uh, question mark, weight of the object, weight of, wait, the mass is 12. So shouldn't it be 0 point times 9.8? Oh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so that's basically the same thing. Okay, so we lost, how many points? We lost two points here. And then we lost, uh, well, we did this part, so that would be, Another point. So we lost three points on this question, that's fine. Let's start the timer and go for the next one. All right, a pendulum of length L consists of a block of one of mass 3M attached to the end of a string. Block one is released from rest with the string horizontal as shown above. Bottom of the swing, block one collides with block two of mass M, which is initially at rest at the edge of the table of height two up. Block one never touches the table as a result of the collision block two, what the heck? Block 2 is launched horizontally from the table, landing on the floor a distance 4 off from the base. Okay. After the collision, block 1 continues forward and swings up. At the highest point, the string makes an angle. Okay. Determine the speed of block 1 at the bottom. So this should just be a uh, conservation of energy thing. So I'm assuming that it barely touches the bottom. Okay, so it should be like MGL, which is should be your conservation of energy, is equal to 1 half mv squared, so v should just be equal to root 2gl. Noise. Now the reason why that works is because the tension of the string doesn't do any work on the block, so the only thing that does work on the block is gravity, so the speed should be root 2gl at the bottom. Okay, on the dot below, label the forces that act on block 1 just before it makes contact. So basically you only got gravity, fg, and then uh, it should, okay, so the upward force should be significantly bigger, so I'll reduce the size of this one. Because it's, in, it's going in centripetal, I can't talk. It's going in centripetal motion, right? So in order to keep it in the circle, this got to be bigger. So this would be F tension. Okay. And then C, basically it says that mv squared over r, which is your centripetal acceleration or centripetal force plus your weight because Ft has to create the centripetal acceleration, but also got to counteract the force. And then this is equal to Ft. And r is just going to be L, so this should be... 2mg plus mg, so 3mg. Noise! Oh nice, they're not even making us do the collision nonsense. Or are they? Well, for this we could do, okay, let's see. So the time is basically purely dependent on how long it takes to fall the distance 2L. So it starts with zero vertical velocity and it drops 2L. So we can literally just use one half gt squared is equal to 2L and then solve for t. So we get root 4L over g. Okay, and then d, Oh wait, this was D, and then this is E. We could say that the speed of block 2 has to leave the table. Well, how far does it go? So we know that the speed as it leaves the table stays constant as its horizontal velocity. So that means that our Vt, Vxt, is equal to 4L. So if we just divide, then we get root 4LG is equal to, 4GL actually, is equal to Vx. Let me just plug this in here. Okay, and then F. 
calculate the speed of block one right after it collides with block two. So that would just be conservation of momentum. So uh, it originally has root GL. Wait, what are the masses? Oh, 3m. So 3m root 2gl is equal to 3m v prime plus m root 4gl. Okay. So that means that if we subtract this, it would be, wait, that's kind of nasty though. Well, maybe we use a calculator. Okay, so it would be 3 root 2 minus root 4, which is 2. Oh, wait, I'm trolling. So this could just be 2 root L over G, and then and then this would be 2 root GL. Okay. And then this would be 3, my, 3 root 2 minus 2 over 3. M, or no, actually it would be root GL. It's equal to V prime. So if we calculate this out, what do we get? 3 squared times, whoops, 3 times squared 2, minus 2 over 3, 0 0.74, like, 8, 748 GL, root GL. Nice. And then the last one is the theta max. So basically you say that the kinetic energy gets converted to potential energy. So that basically says that 1 half times uh, 0. Point, whoops, 0 0.748 squared, and then GL. Oh, so the G's cancel out and this will be L is equal to H. So this is your H and then, so your H is like this distance from the block to the table. So if we want to find theta max, we got to find the difference between L and like this. So we do one minus one half times 0 0.748 squared over L. And then this is equal to cosine theta max. And then we can just do cosine inverse, let's do that. Our cos times 1 minus 1 half times 0 0.748 squared. Uh, and then to get from radians, we multiply by pi over 1. Oops, we multiply by 180 over pi. And you get 43.9. Nice. Epic, let us check our answers. Okay, root 2gl, that's what we got. Alright, that's what we got. Ft should be bigger. Nice. Bra moment. Oh, wait, we forgot to I. Oh. Oh, we did 3 little mg. We did 3 mg. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we would get the one point, we would lose another point. Oh my god, why am I making so many skillies today? Well, anyway, there would be 3 times 3 mg. Okay. Bruh. Alrighty. Are we... Oh, we're given the length of the... Bruh. Okay, wait. <laughs> okay, don't worry. I will not do this on the actual test. Don't worry. So, bruh, I literally didn't even read this. Okay, you know what? Let's plug it in and see what happens. So, 2 times the... Square root of 0 0.75, it's centimeters, right? Yeah. Over 9.8. And that gives us 0 0.55 for time. And then for velocity, you're going to get uh, multiply here. And that would be equal to 5. Point, what? Bro, 5.42. Or 5.4, let's say. Because they wanted two sig figs. Okay. And then we got to do 0 0.48 times this thing. 0.748 and that will give us 2.0 I guess and then over here it stays the same let us test this boy out 0.55 5.45 I guess I wanted but wait why is it giving three six figs all of a sudden no that's just not right okay 2.02 .02, whatever that's fine uh let's see 43.5 43.9 close enough okay good so that one we only lost like one point good and then let's do the last one a horizontal circular platform with rotational inertia IP rotates freely without friction on a vertical axis. Small motor driven wheel that is used to rotate the platform is mounted under the platform and touches it. The wheel has radius R and touches the platform at distance D from the vertical axis of the platform. The platform starts to rest, blah blah blah. Okay, so during time T, the wheel stays in contact with the platform without slipping. Derive an expression for the angular speed. Okay, so basically you have that I omega P or IP omega P is equal to the amount of force or amount of torque times the amount of time. So that would be F times R, which is the FD over, I mean, no, times delta T. So your double P is just gonna be FD delta T over IP. Noise. B, kinetic energy of the platform at the moment it reaches angular speed omega P. Wait, did we not just do one half IP? Oh, are we so, oh, you can't use omega P in the thing. So we just gotta square this nonsense. So this would go on the bottom and it would be F squared D squared delta T squared over, put parentheses, over IP. Okay, 
Derive an expression for the angular speed of the wheel when the platform has reached angular speed omega p. Well, let's think about it this way, right? So let's say the platform goes a whole revolution. Or wait. Well, yeah, let's say the platform goes a whole revolution, right? Then the wait. Okay, so basically the tangential velocity the at the wheel for the platform is equal to wp times d. So that'll give you the speed of the point like right here. And then we got to divide by r in order to get the angular speed of the other thing. Oh, okay. So yeah, so it does literally like that. WPD over r. All right, d. So for this one, like one exerts a uh, force on the other and that like that slows down one of them and speeds up the other one, right? So the thing that's conserved here is going to be angular momentum because whatever the force changes angular momentum on one of them is going to do the same change in angular momentum for the other one. So we can basically say that our i omega p is equal to i p omega p is equal to 2 i p omega f. And that basically gives us that omega f is equal to omega p over 2. Epic. Oh, there's another page, what the heck? Holy, holy moly, what the heck? So long, okay, anyways. So now we use a rotating platform to determine the rotational inertia of an unknown object or about the vertical axis that passes through the center. Okay, nice. So different values of omega i. So basically the way that this react, I mean this thing changes here is just gonna be like, instead of two ip, it would be ip plus iu, wf. So basically wf is equal to ip, plus over IP plus IU WI. So the slope should just be equal to this. On the graph, okay, so we draw, uh, I'm not gonna do that because that's easy. Okay, so we draw that. And then we gotta calculate the slope. Hmm, let's see. So our best fit line is gonna look something like this. And it'll go through, I'm assuming it'll go through this point kind of. But we'll, we'll say it goes through this point from the 10, four to zero, zero. Is that decent? Yeah, I think that's pretty decent. Okay, so our slope is going to be 4 over 10, 2 fifths. So basically IP over IP plus IU is equal to 2 fifths. And then 5 IP is equal to 2 IP plus 2 IU. And then uh, IU is just equal to IP 3 fifths of that. I mean 3 halves. So that is equal to 3 halves times 3.1. 4.65. So let's do 4.6. And then what else do we need to figure out? The kinetic energy of the spinning platform before the object is dropped on it is Ki. Total energy of the thing, okay. Now because they stick together, it's like it's like an inelastic collision. So your Kf is gonna be less than Ki. And I guess we'll just explain it through the fact that, like, I mean, we could just do out the math, but I don't feel like doing it right now. Basically the reasoning is that it's inelastic. One of the students observed that the center of mass of the object is not actually aligned with the axis of the platform. The experimental value of IU obtained in part E greater than, less than, or equal to the actual value. Okay. So by the parallel axis theorem, right, if you don't align it perfectly, or like if the rotation axis is off from the center of mass, the moment of inertia is higher. So in this case, like we measured the rotational inertia of the increased version. So the actual one should be less than. So that's my explanation. Okay, let us check our answer. Anyway, what would it be? So it'd be, it would be greater than. Okay, all right, that's what we got. Uh, also what we got, epic, even more epic, fairly epic, except their line is completely different from ours. But whatever, it should be fine. Yeah, something around there. And then K of 11 Ki, inelastic collision, good job, okay. Greater than and then parallel axis in. Epic! We did it! Let's go! How many time how much time do we have left on the timer? 18 minutes, very cool. Let's go! <laughs> I actually did so many to leave mistakes though, so like I mean it wasn't great, but hope that was helpful. That's basically how I approach these kind of things. If you guys want me to make a more in-depth video for this, I'll try to get to that. But I don't know whether I'll have time this week. We'll see. Alrighty, thank you guys for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. If you guys want more of these kind of videos, just let me know. Thank you guys so much for watching and see you guys next time.